Beauties and Beasties out there. Welcome to Beauties and Beasts, a podcast of all things beauty and the beast. I'm DF, and March is Women's History Month, where we celebrate the accomplishments of all women throughout history. As I've said before, fairy tales have been used as a tool to promote feminism even in the early days, but woman power didn't always mean the same thing. Like when Madame de Beaumont wrote Beauty and the Beast in the 18th century. Arranged marriages were expected for young women, so Beaumont wrote a story where a young young woman finds power in a seemingly powerless situation, and in a way teaches men not to treat their potential mates like prisoners. But not all fairy tales are that progressive. A lot of them have modern feminists reeling, like the one we're going to talk about today, and for good reason. You all know the tale of Sleeping Beauty, whether you read it as a child, or you saw the Disney movie, or you've seen Tchaikovsky's ballet. And I think we can all agree it's generally not okay to kiss a girl while she's asleep, even if it'll save her life. Huh? Actually,、uh, not that bad if you think of it as a magical form of CPR. But if you think saying it's okay to kiss a girl while she's asleep is okay, wait till you hear. Yeah, if you think that's not. That if you think that's not okay, wait until you hear the original story, and you'll actually prefer the one you know. That said, I have to give a warning. This episode contains mentions of sexual assault. Yeah, that's right. Listener discretion is advised. Oh, so we have a one of our patrons here, Bella Pink Savage, saying that she never saw the Disney movie or any other version of this, so this ought to be good. I'm very surprised that you've never seen any version of Sleeping Beauty, so this will be educational for you both. On that note, I'd like to thank my five dollar plus patrons: Arvin Joshua Rocks Fifteen, Bella Pink Savage, Cosmic Trail, and Tyrannosaurus Venom. Two of them are in the chat right now. Thank you for your continuing support. You too can become a patron, access episodes, and join these private live streams, and also access some of my YouTube videos early by pledging a certain amount a month. Just go to the link, or go to patron.podbean.com/slash/beautiesandbeasts and become a patron there. You can also show your support by buying my merchandise on Redbubble. I'm about to get my first dose of the COVID vaccine, but I will still be wearing my mask in public for protection for, against against myself for for myself and for others, of course. If you buy a mask from Redbubble. One will be donated to Hard Charge International for someone on the front lines who needs it. And you can check out my cloth, ma- cloth masks and fitted masks that I also have available on my account page. Just go to DisneyFanatic23.RedBubble.com or follow the link in the description below. Along with other products from clothing to stickers to notebooks to pillows and much, much more. Before we delve into the origins of Sleeping Beauty, let's go over the mainstream version everybody knows, except apparently the people in the chat here. Actually, there are two main versions of Sleeping Beauty. The first is the 1696 version by Charles Perrault, or at, as its title in French, La Belle au Bois Dormant, The Sleeping Beauty in the Woods. You may know Charles Perrault for a no- number of other fairy tales, such as Cinderella. The second is the 1812 Brothers Grimm variant, Little Briar Rose, which is almost word for word similar, but with a few minor differences. I'll start with how Perrault writes it, as this is what most of you may be familiar with. Once upon a time, there's this king and queen who really want a child, as most fairy tales seem to start with. Then one day, their wish is granted. In the Grimm version, a frog comes out of the queen's bath while she is bathing to tell her that she is going to have a baby. Uh, yeah, I don't know why.、Uh, what is with the Grimm brothers and creepy frogs popping out of nowhere? Anyway, the king and queen have a girl, and because they are not sexist and are happy to have a child, no matter what the gender, they throw a big celebration in her honor. The princess has no name in the Perrault version, but the Grimm brothers call her Briar Rose, so I'll be calling her that from now on to avoid confusion. At the party, seven angels descend from heaven to bless the baby. 
in the grim version it's 12 wise women but many modern versions make them fairies the disney version narrowed it down to three fairies so the angels slash wise women slash fairies each bestow gifts on briar rose such as beauty kindness musical talent everything a typical fairy tale princess needs before the last angel can give her gift another angel dressed in dark robes appears in Perot's version, she just appears in the line of angels, and the Grimm brothers add how angry she is for being intentionally uninvited to the party, and not getting a golden plate at the table. Apparently, the king only had 12 golden plates. Uh, uh, yeah, pettiness, right? Either way, our angry angel slash fairy slash wise woman puts a curse on Briar Rose that she will one day prick her finger on the spindle of a spinning wheel and die. And Grimm specifies that it'll be on her 15th birthday, which is practically womanhood in medieval times. Soon as Discount Maleficent leaves, this, the final magic lady still has her gift to give, and she cannot undo it completely, but she changes the curse so Briar Rose will not die, but will fall into a deep sleep for a hundred years, until the son of a king comes to wake her. You know, here's an idea. Why don't the king and queen just try and, I don't know, have a son and skip the hundred year thing altogether so that that son of a king can wake them up, wake her up, or, you know, find any son of a king to do the job when it's time? Why the hundred years? That part just seems a little unnecessary, Miss Good Fairy. But the king still fears for his daughter's life, so he orders every spinning wheel in the kingdom to be destroyed. Good idea. And then he forgets all about the curse. Bad idea. Because no one can apparently remember something so big, like a hundred year nap curse. No one tells Briar about it as the years go by. Oh, come on, that's like forgetting to tell your loved one they have cancer. What's with parents in these fairy tales? Briar is now 15 and the king and queen are out for a day on their second honeymoon. Uh, no, really, they go off to a secluded cottage to be alone for a few days, when their daughter is fated to be cursed into a deep sleep. I rest my case. Briar is exploring the palace and enters a room she's never seen before. Inside is an old woman at a spinning wheel. Briar is curious to know what she's doing as she's never seen anyone spin before because of her father's decree for a reason. And she asks to try it. And what do you know? While the old woman is showing her, Briar pricks her, her finger on the spindle and she falls down asleep. Later versions say this is the evil fairy in disguise, but in actuality it's just a senile old woman who hasn't heard of the decree. Because apparently nobody's told her or she's too crazy to actually know this. Honestly, the villain in this tale is not as active as she is in the Disney version. So the old lady calls for help and everyone tries to wake the princess, but she's out cold. The king returns and calls for the good angel, and after laying Briar in a comfy bed so that, you know, she's not sleeping on a cold floor for a hundred years, the angel puts everyone else in the kingdom to sleep so that they can all wake up with the princess a hundred years later, so she won't be alone. Though again, why a hundred? Once everyone's asleep, a whale... A wall of brambles and thorns grows around the castle, making it impossible for anyone to enter. Uh, and you know what? This fairy tale actually doesn't specify where these brambles come from, but of course later versions have the evil fairy uh, put the cast put the put the wall of thorns around so that the curse cannot be broken. Uh, honestly, uh, Perot doesn't specify a lot of things. 100 years go by, and a young prince is hunting near the bramble wall hearing all sorts of rumors from the peasants, like a man-eating giant living behind it, or there being a haunted old castle. And then one old man tells him of a story his father told him of the most beautiful princess in the world sleeping in the castle behind the wall, only to be awakened by the son of a king. Naturally, the prince thinks that means him, and so he goes to the wall, which magically parts for him. Seriously, this guy doesn't even have to put in an effort? The Disney prince was at least more heroic. Anyway, everyone's asleep in the castle. The prince makes it to where Sleeping Beauty sleeps, kneels down, and she wakes up. Hold on, I think we skipped something important, like the kiss? Uh, yep, apparently Perot omits the kiss, uh, either that or it just wasn't translated. That was added in by the Grimm brothers. 
just him being there was enough, I guess? And not having to kiss her or do anything else untoward while she's asleep? Okay, Perot, some respect. The prince and princess talk for hours and hours until everyone else wakes, so at least they get to know each other. A marriage ceremony is held, and the happy couple soon have two children named La Roar, or Dawn, and Le Jour, Day. The end, happily ever after, right? Wrong! The Grimm Brothers version ends, their, ends with the marriage, but Perros goes on to a part two that is lesser known, something akin to what you may have heard from Snow White. So, it goes like this. The prince has to keep his marriage a secret, apparently, because his mother is apparently of over lineage and doesn't want her finding out that he now has a wife and kids. Yeah, I'd love to know the story behind that. But when the time comes for the prince to ascend the throne, he has to bring his family to the kingdom so they can rule. And then while the prince is away, for some reason, the ogress queen orders that orders her cook to prepare Little Prince Day for her supper. The king, the, the cook, who is actually a nice guy, substitutes a lamb for the boy and then hides Day away, deep into the forest. The next day, the queen demands to have Dawn for her supper, for which the cook substitutes a young goat, and then the queen wants to eat her daughter-in-law, the cook serves up a deer instead and reunites Sleeping Beauty with her children in hiding. The queen then discovers a trick and is about to throw the cook in a tub of vipers until her son returns just in the nick of time to throw the ogress in the tub instead, and then they, and then they all live happily ever after. Uh, yeah, I know what you're thinking. What? Was all this necessary? Couldn't we have just stopped the story where, you know, kiss, wake up, everyone lives happily ever after? Yeah, the Grins didn't think, seem to think that too. But they did write another story, t completely separate from Sleeping Beauty, called The Evil Mother-in-Law, with this uh, ogress plot. And, of course, there is Snow White's stepmother ordering the Huntsman to carve out her heart, and then later eats it. Uh, but the Huntsman switches out Snow White's heart for an animal heart. Woo! Lots of cannibalism in these fairy tales. The only reason I can think of Perot including this second act is that his story is actually taken from an older Italian tale by Giambattista Basile called Sun, Moon, and Talia, published posthumously in 1634. This was in turn based on various different folk tales, but considering how similar this story is in plot to Perot's version, it's safe to say this was his main inspiration. And honestly, Charles Perot made it better. After you hear this, you're going to want to prefer the version that you know. Here's where the listener discretion warning comes. <sighs> okay. In, Bas in Basile's story, the Sleeping Beauty is named Talia. Her father, a lord, learns from his astrologers that Talia would one day be in danger caused by a splinter of flax. So, no evil fairy here, it's just fate, apparently. Sure enough, one day she pierces her finger with a splinter of flax and passes out. Her father, thinking she is dead, settles her on a throne and then and then just locks up the house and leaves. Wow, this dad is even worse. But no, she's not actually dead, she's just in a deep sleep. Of course he doesn't bother to check her breathing! One day, a king is passing by the house and his falcon flies inside. The king knocks on the door to get his falcon back, but no one answers. So he climbs in through the window, you know, like a normal person. Finds Talia unconscious. He's unable to wake her, so his first thought is to carry her to a bed and... Uh, uh, oh boy. Oh, I can't even say it. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, let's just say that he steals more than just a kiss. The king leaves, and months later, the still-sleeping Talia gives birth to twins. Yep, you heard that right. Okay, okay, I gotta upset people in the chat right now, just bear with me. And then one of the babies sucks Talia's finger, taking the splinter out, and she awakes. And finding that she's now a single mom with twins, and is like, what the hey happened? The king comes back and finds Talia awake with twins, who she's named Sun and Moon. He explains what happened, and then they end up bonding. I'm sorry, what? 
but he has to go back to his kingdom, but promises to return for Talia later. And at home, the king's wife hears him mutter, Talia, sun and moon, in his sleep. Hold up, he's already married? That's even worse! The jealous queen then carries out pretty much the same plan as the ogress mother-in-law did in Sleeping Beauty to Talia and her twins with the cook saving them. Because it's obviously their fault your husband raped another woman in her sleep. So why don't you punish him instead? The king then learns the truth and has his wife burned alive and then marries Talia and then they all live happily ever after. I need a moment. Yeah, after hearing this, I don't really mind the whole kissing thing. Especially if the prince knew kissing her would break the curse. I mean, it's for the same reason you would give someone mouth to mouth if they were unconscious, right? I mean, the king rapes a sleeping girl, forcing her to be a mother, and then his wife takes her anger out on that uh, unwilling family instead of her husband. The wife gets killed, even though, actually, she's the one I feel the most sorry for, and Talia too. And the king gets uh, gets the, the new wife that he raped? What did the king do to deserve this reward? Yes, thank you. Belloping Savage sums it up. This story is terrible. So you can thank Charles Perrault for fixing it. Although, still could have done without the ogre's mother-in-law part. Uh, since then, Sleeping Beauty has been adapted many times, most famously by Tchaikovsky in his ballet, first performed in 1890. You can thank Tchaikovsky for the Sleeping Beauty waltz, you may know as Once Upon a Dream from Disney's 1959 animated classic, another version a lot of our modern audiences know. It was Tchaikovsky who gave the princess the name Aurora from Perrault's name for Sleeping Beauty's daughter. Disney used both the names of Aurora and Briar Rose, the latter being an alias when the king and queen take extra precautionary measures by sending their daughter to be raised hidden in the woods by the three good fairies. Still doesn't explain why you bring her back early for her to prick her finger on the spinning wheel. Disney had Princess Aurora and Prince Philip meet before the whole curse, which kind of you know, takes out the whole hundred years clause and just makes it a couple days. And they talk for like five minutes, meaning true love. Okay, slight improvement, but still quite not perfected. Okay, uh, let's be real. Sleeping Beauty, in general, is probably not the most active heroine ever. I mean, all she has to do is sleep to get her happily ever after. Which would be very convenient in real life, but, you know, real life doesn't work that way. That's why feminists are so harsh on this fairy tale, and the Disney film in turn. Though, if you think about it, for 1959, Disney's Sleeping Beauty is more feminist than it looks. Sure, the titular char character does almost nothing, and is really more of a plot device than a character. Unless you consider the three good fairies as the protagonists, rather than Sleeping Beauty. And they actually do most of the work in the film. They're the ones who decide to protect Aurora and hide her away in the woods. They're the ones who go to the evil fairy Maleficent's castle to save the prince. They're the ones who supply the magical weapons for the prince to cut through the brambles and then defeat Maleficent when she turns into a dragon. And, not to mention, they are three single women raising a baby without the help of a man. Forget Sleeping Beauty and the Prince, the fairies are the real MVPs of this movie. Probably the only problem I had with Disney's 2014 live-action reimagining of Sleeping Beauty, Maleficent, from the evil fairies' perspective, is that the good fairies were made totally useless in that movie. Which was a big step down from how powerful the characters were in the original film. But I do like Maleficent as it fixed every other problem I had with Sleeping Beauty. Where, for one thing, Maleficent has a bigger beef than not being invited to one party, which I thought was petty to begin with. And, I mean, overkill. You're not invited to a party, so you're going to pretty much murder a baby? Uh, yeah, a bit much there. Aurora has more screen time and a little bit more personality. Uh, the prince is not automatically her true love after five minutes, and the real kiss of true love is a motherly one. Someday I'll make Maleficent its own episode, as it deserves it. Uh-oh, and then Bella Pink Savage. And then Aurora and Philip had a bratty spawn named Audrey. The end. Don't mind me. My young innocent brain is just having a stroke. LOL. I know what you mean. You're referring to Disney's descendants with 
Audrey. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, let's not talk about her. Of course, there have been other TV and book adaptations. My personal favorite being E.D. Baker's The Wide Awake Princess series, centering around Sleeping Beauty's younger sister, Annie, who was blessed to be impervious to any kind of magic, uh, which the parents had done because they were already worried about their older daughter being cursed to sleep. So when Annie's sister goes into a deep sleep, she's the only one awake in the kingdom, and she goes out to find the prince who can wake her sister. Annie's a much more relatable and capable heroine who can think for herself. And Edie Baker, on the whole, puts delightful twists on her on well-known fairy tales uh, once before with the Frog Princess. Still including some romance, but, you know, it's more natural and not forced like some fairy tales we know. Bella Pink Savage says, ah, much better, thumbs up. Yeah, I'd really recommend any anything by Edie Baker, whether it's the Frog Princess or the Wide Awake Princess or the books following afterwards. They are really good. Like, like they honor the classic fairy tales you know, but they also make them with relatable characters and make everything much more consensual in certain places. <laughs> but what can we learn from Sleeping Beauty as a whole? Uh, you know, I'm kind of stumped on this one. Uh, like, what's the moral? Always invite crazy people so they don't get mad at you and put your daughter to sleep? Killing, sorry, sorry, kissing sleeping girls is okay as long as they're under a spell? Mother-in-laws are monsters? Uh, always trust good fairies and not fairies who are cloaked in darkness? Okay, okay, I don't like this fairy tale very much. Bella Pink Savage uh, suggests the moral always have pepper spray. Yeah. Yeah, never mind feminism. It, it, this fairy tale makes absolutely no sense to me. If you want a feminist version, I would recommend either Maleficent or the Wide Awake Princess. And yes, even the Disney version's not so bad. At least it's the first time Disney ever gave one of their princes a name. And he actually does something, so he's not just a pretty plot device. Honestly, though, I wouldn't mind going to sleep for a hundred years and waking up to a ready-made true love. I'd at least like to sleep through this effed-up century we're living in now. Sigh. Okay, so, uh, that is everything I have on my notes, thank goodness, because, oh boy, I have to explain that, I'm very long-winded. Uh, anything, uh, the patrons would like to add from the chat? Yeah, Bella Pink Savage, amen, yes, sorry that I may have triggered you or ruined your childhood that is why I'm marking this as explicit and not for kids okay while you're thinking of that the poll for the next episode actually came to a tie so I'm gonna have to make an executive decision and for the next episode I'll be doing uh, Hans Christian Andersen's Thumbelina after this one I really want to do a fairy tale that doesn't make me want to gag okay Bella Pink Savage says, That's okay, at least in our modern world, if I was in her situation, the guy would get punched in the nose and probably get pepper sprayed too. Yeah, I mean, unless it's CPR, then, then it's kind of, you know, you're trying to save their life. But then again, they didn't have CPR back then, so... Questionable. And yes, the poll came to a tie again. Uh, but if you guys become patrons, then you would be able to v add your vote to all the all the weekly polls, and decides the topic for next episodes. Hey, uh, if anyone else ha has anything to add to the conversation, uh, even, even though it's probably difficult right now, oh boy. Yeah, I'm just not comfortable uh, uh, t talking about this. But I think we can agree Sleeping Beauty has inspired a lot of people, and they've at least tried to make it okay. All right, well, if nobody has anything else to add, then I'm going to sign off for now. Uh, remember to follow this podcast if you're on Podbean or subscribe if you're on YouTube. If you want to show your support, become a patron or go buy my merchandise on Redbubble, um, especially the masks. We're still in a pandemic. We still need them, okay? At least you should have something that suits your, suits your interests and is colorful and fashionable. Okay. All right, and once again, sorry for triggering you guys. Have a good day, and if anybody tries to kiss you in your sleep for reasons other than resuscitation, 
Yeah, punch him in the nose, pepper spray. Good night.